uh, we proceed to the keynote address. The topic of the keynote address is Innovations in THR by Dr. Jim Sullivan. Work on hip arthroplasty has been directed at materials and um, articulations. And the bioengineers at the moment think they've got it pretty right. They think they've got implants which can um, regularly get ingrown. They've got good bearing services which are enduring. And um, if the implants are put in properly, they do well. So some of the ongoing problems we've got with hip replacement are surgical technique and component positioning. And suboptimal acetabular component placement may lead to dislocation, edge loading, impingement, and early implant failure due to accelerated wear. Also issues with leg length discrepancy, which is a real problem, particularly in our community, with uh, litigation. Surgical inaccuracy and complications are costly. 400,000 hips done in the US per year. The dislocation rate is probably around 3.8 to 4 per cent within two years, and it's the most common cause of early revision. The recent data from the Australian Registry from 400, uh, 40,000 hips per year, the most common re reasons for revision are osteolysis and dislocation, and the first four years dislocation is the number one reason for revision. Um, in a tradition, in uh, putting hip hips in the normal way, uh, how accurate is in a Canberra study? of 100 cases, uh, only 71% of, of the femoral and 45% of the acetabular components were within the predicted range that they had put them in. And of the 50 acetabular components, 45% were in the, the target zone of 10 to 30 degrees of version, although this increased to 60% when the role of a hooded liner was introduced. So there is a big opportunity for improved accuracy. If we look at um, the experience out of MGH, comparing component position, how many are in the target zone. High volume surgeons managed manage to get it right 50% of the time. Surgeons who are on the, re the, the resident only in 30% of the time. It's even harder with uh, small incisions and when the patients are obese. So at the moment we haven't got quite a, as right as it possibly can be. And so when that happens, somebody usually turns to a robot for assistance. And some of the companies now are looking at using robots to assist with uh, implantation of cups. So the planning's done with 3D CT as opposed to 2D plane, uh, plane X-rays. And then the execution's done the same as you would if you're doing a computer-assisted computer uh, insertion of implants. So with the robotic arm-assisted hip replacement, and uh, one of our hospitals has bought a robot, and so that's why I'm interested in it. You can compare the manual templating on, the, uh, on this side. We're just putting our template up and on the, on the other side you do the templating on a 3D scanner. So you can actually try and reproduce the size of the stem, the offset, the leg length, the cup size and the orientation. The way it's done is you put an uh, ECG marker on the patella uh, before you drape. Then after you drape you put a raise on the pelvis for your a computer navigation. You put a couple of check points uh, in. You put one on the trochanter, one above the acetabulum, and then you can remove the uh, femoral head, and then you dislocate, uh, after dislocating the hip, and then you do a couple of points on the femur, on the, oh, sorry, on the acetabulum, you get three markers on the acetabulum, so that the computer can match up the, the, the real bone with the virtual bone. And then you do your, your registration as you would in a knee replacement for computer assisted surgery. And then you do verification points, the same, it's basically computer assisted surgery. Following that, the acetabular reaming is done with the, the planned size reamer. So if you think it's a 52 size cup you're putting in, it's line to line reaming, you'd put a 52 reamer in, it goes on the robot arm. It's introduced into the mouth of the acetabulum and the robot will only engage when it's close enough to engage. It allows about a 10 degree arc of freedom so that you can circularly ream. And it's just done to, like painting, you just remove the green spots in the acetabulum until you get down to the, to the pre-planned depth and then the robot stops, the robot swaps the reaming. The cup impactions 
is similar, except the haptic's different in that there's no play in the, in the arm. So the, the cup's introduced into the mouth, the acetabulum, and then the robot, the robot will lock the arm and it can be only introduced in the line that it was pre-planned to be put in. After that, you can use your, your, your checkpoints to see whether you're fully seated. You can then compare the, uh, the virtual X-ray with the recovery X-ray and see that they're, they're pretty spot on. And comparing early results out of uh, Wisconsin shows that this has reduced the patients in the target range to, to um, close to 100% um, with only a few, degree, few, few outliers. So this robotic arm-assisted surgery, clearly it's highly accurate and reproducible. And this sort of thing is going to be very popular when the public hears about it, as, as, as is happening in the US. But clearly the disadvantages are the cost of the robot, the extra imaging with the CT scan, and the extra operating room time. Um, people who, who've done a lot of it say it adds only 15 minutes. I find that a little bit hard to believe. Um, it's probably more like 30 minutes. And the other issue we've got is we still haven't really clearly identified what is the true position for the ideal cup. So there's still no consensus on what orientation to achieve for your cup. So even though you can get it spot on with the robot, it may not still be in the right place. So the study demonstrates that there is no consensus on the optimum orientation for the acetabular component in THR. Well oriented. What is the safe zone? 12,000 hips implanted between 2003 and 2012 at the Mayo Clinic. 58% of the dislocations that occurred after that were inside the so-called Lewinick safe zone. So seemingly well-oriented cups can run into problems. This one on the top here was revised for squeaking. Patient revised for recurrent dislocation. Patient revised for high metal iron levels. All look spot on. If you look at how a cup orientation currently is measured and planned, it's done with an AP X-ray or a CT scan. Both of these are static measurements, but these complications don't occur when the patient's lying down on, in their bed normally or lying on a table. Dislocations occur during functional pelvic movements, so a low sit to stand, bending, shoe tying, basically flexion and rotation. If we look at this um, view of a pelvis, 45 degrees of inclination of the cup, 25 degrees of antiversion. If the, if the pelvis extends, or it flexes, this becomes 40, 40, uh, 54 degrees of inclination and 38 degrees of antiversion, or 41 degrees of inclination, 10 degrees of antiversion. So a study done looking at um, 1,500 hips over a two-year two -year lifetime span, um, they looked at three functional measurements, a, a supine x-ray, a standing x-ray, and a seated uh, flexed x-ray. So supine, uh, patients, the bell curve starts at about 4.2 degrees of pelvic tilt. When they stand, the hip extends to minus 1.3 degrees on average. And when they're sitting, it's a much broader bell curve. So, so the hips can either flex or extend when they're sitting. So there's quite a big variation. So if you look at the change from supine to standing, generally there's a, a five and a half degree of pelvic extension. From sitting, it's a much broader range. But looking at even at this group of patients, if with the hip rotating posteriorly or extending, you increase the antiversion um, by more than 13 degrees in 6% of cases. And when they sit, you increase the, um, the ex uh, flexion of the, of the hip by 11 degrees in, in more than 13% of cases. So that means that 11% of, of patients move into the outside the safe zone when they're sitting, and 6% move out of the side the safe zone when they're standing. If you add a five degree error into that, it increases the volume of patients who are outside the so-called safe zone dramatically. So this patient was, um, had their hip implanted using navigation, their hips in at 42.26, which is what people would normally think was a good position. Standing, they go to 54.42, with quite a lot of increased antiversion of the cup, and dislocated anteriorly. 
Another case, patient 34, 20 degrees, patient with a melon poly cup, sitting, she's a current dislocator, she's got a, a fixed lumbar spine, and she's retroverting uh, by 20 degrees when she sits because she's got no movement in her back and she's coming out the back. So the, the safe zone, the predictor zone is not right for everybody. The functional antiversion was only 40, four degrees when she uh, rose off a chair. So if seemingly well-oriented cups can be functionally malrotated due to the patient's um, sagittal pelvic kinematics, can we predict who these patients might be and modify the cup position? And this is, um, one of these companies has come up with a system where they look at patient-specific dynamic stimulation of a sit-to-stand, a contralateral leg raise, which is producing functional extension, and the kinematics defined by these three functional uh, radiographs, supine, sitting flexed, and extended. And this matched with a CT. So you do the functional X-ray standing. You can see the alignment there of the pelvis. It's um, 1.2 degrees uh, flexed. Sitting, it goes to 15 degrees. Contralateral reg raise extends a further one degree from the, from the um, standing position. And with a sit to stand, they can then marry that with the CT scan, a, a, um, a generated alignment a film. That video is not going to play, but basically the video shows the, the leg bending to full sitting position and coming back again. And you can see the change in angle of the pelvis as it goes through that range of motion. Now, if you look at the contact patch and joint replacement, this is dependent on the magnitude of the joint reaction forces, the head size, the clearance and the materials. But you can calculate what the contact point is in hips, depending on those variables, and measure out against the orientation of the implants, how much the um, contact patch is over the uh, rim of the pelvis, and this one you can uh, rim, rim of the cup. This one's minus three degrees that the patch goes past the edge of the rim, and you can reproduce this contact patch in that by marrying that CT scan, which didn't fortunately work, and it will show where the head tracks from sit to stand. In this case, you see it goes off the edge. And so then they can provide you with nine different, variation, nine ver different variations of way the cup placement could be to see one which best ma uh, matches the patient-specific zone. And then they optimise where the, where the cup should be. And so they will give you a uh, feed out saying this patient's cup range should be more flexed, or more closed, more antiverted, or more retroverted. And you can see most of those cups are predicted to be in the safe zone, but a patient's cup who's, who's going to be on this side of the, of, the, uh, of the zone is not going to be the same function as the patient on that side of the zone. So if that patient was put there, they'd probably come out the front. So it's, it's predicting what part of the safe zone the particular patient is best served by. Now, if you're going to do that, you need, a three, you need some way to put the cup in exactly where it's pre-programmed to go, and they use a patient-specific um, guides for this. Uh, and it's, you can see the cup in a, in, a, uh, in a graphic to see that it's seated properly. There's no overhang. The shell's covered at the front, so there's no psoas impingement. So the consideration you're looking at, are you trying to minimise... Um, edge loading while also avoiding anterior edge loading. You're planning for the pelvic tilt changes post-operatively. You want sufficient bony coverage of the shell, particularly at the front. You want to avoid psoas impingement and irritation. Uh, they can match it to the surgical approach for its posterior anterior. And you can also add in what the effect of the uh, femoral component antiversion is. So this, is, um, this situation is ideal for patient-specific delivery. It's not comp compromised by the patient's position on the table because the implants, the, uh, the alignment guides put into the pelvis, you can match where it goes. You put a laser marker in to show where it should be. If the pelvis moves, the laser marker moves. And then when you go to put the cup in, you match up the alignment with the laser marker. So it's another form of um, robotic orientated insertion. So 100 consecutive hips, three different surgeons, the accuracy measured 
uh, with the CT scan postoperatively, 91% within 10 degrees of the planned positioning, and 56 were, in, were within 5 degrees. So the accuracy was comparable with images, images NAV, and, um, but the orientation has been predetermined specific to that patient. Combined with this to get it right for leg length and offset, you can get a, you get a, uh, a jig which will fit on the back or the front of the femoral neck which shows you where to do the, do the osteotomy plane. Doing the osteotomy plane in that position means, and you pre-plan what the offset is, means that you're pretty well going to get your leg length and, and offset right every time. Uh, Post-operative x-rays can marry with your 3D image. You can see it's very accurate. So, conclusion with this thing. Cup orientation matters. Manual, ac manual accuracy and uncertain is not consistent. Edge loading, accelerated wear, dislocation, impingement, occur during functional activities, um, not the patient supine. Cup orientation will be significantly altered in these functional positions. And the, the ideal patient position for the, each cup in different patients can vary. And, it's, and, and in my view, some form of interoperative verification of cup position is highly desirable. So do I use it? I've used this OPS with, um, in a number of cases. I've used it in, in cases where patients have had a spinal fusion and you're worried about what their pelvis is doing when they're sitting and standing. I also use it in, in young females who are quite flexible, where I want to put a ceramic bearing in, I'm worried about getting edge loading. But I don't use it routinely. As I said earlier, I use routinely I use the anterior approach with a traction table and an image intensifier. And with this, I, I'm able to check my abduction angle, my depth of the, of the cup penetration, the brooch size, the alignment, the leg length and the offset, and I think that's improved my accuracy consi consistently. Thanks very much. Uh, hi. <clears throat> I have a question for you. People talk about combined antiversion of the hip. What's your take on that? Co combined antiversion of the hip. You look at the femoral antiversion first and then try to marry the astabular orientation, antiversion on that. What's well, I think take? it varies. I mean, in some patients, some patients, it's acceptable to have probably 30 or 40 degrees of combined antiversion. Other patients, you probably want closer to 20 degrees. It varies. And I think that's been shown by that examination. It depends on how the pelvis moves through a range of motion. But there is, there is an acceptable range where you'll be safe to do that. And generally, around you know, 30, 30 to 40 degrees is probably like 30, 35 degrees is probably OK. Because I do the direct lateral approach for the hip, and if somebody is used to doing a posterior approach, the recommendation is go for 35 to 40 degrees. But you can't achieve that if you're doing a direct lateral approach. This is my experience, I don't know. Maybe with the anterior approach, do you still go for your 35 to 40 degrees? No, normally, normally I would go for the patient's anatomy. So I would try and put the cup in, align with the transverse acetabular ligament, and make yeah. sure it's no overhanging at the front, and make sure it's properly seated. And I put, it, when you're doing uncemented hips, you don't have a lot of variability in what you can do with the, um, with the uh, femoral stem anyway. You tend to have to go along parallel to the posterior neck of the, of the femur. So you tend to marry in back what is their, their, their predetermined relationship. Thank you. If they've got excessive antiversion, 50, 60 degrees, I'll use an Ezrom and dial it back. Thanks.